Hello, I'm Dale Will with the Open Space and Trails program. Fourth generation Coloradan, so I'm pretty fascinated with the history of the state. Since about 1999 when I started with Open Space, we've been studying the history of various properties up and down the Crystal River Valley as well as other places in the county where we've purchased open spaces. What we've done today is put together a corridor study of the history of travelways in the Crystal River Valley. It's the first time that we've, we've looked at a corridor in this way. Uh, the reason for the interest is that uh, last year the governor put our trail from Carbondale to Crested Butte on his list of the 16 trails that uh, he's going to try to uh, help to fruition uh, during the, the remaining time that he's our governor. So we started linking together the historical knowledge we have of how humans have gotten up and down the Crystal River Valley, and it's a really pretty interesting story. What we know about it really starts with the Hayden survey in 1874. Uh, Ferdinand Hayden was able to convince Chief Uray to allow him into the Ute Reservation to do the first cartographically accurate mapping of the western part of Colorado. Uh, the survey data was collected in 1873 and 1874 and documents a network of Ute trails in western Colorado. Uh, at the time this was all within the Ute Reservation. The Ute Trail documented by Hayden starts up on Schofield Pass and runs the entire length of the Crystal River Valley connecting with the Roaring Fork Valley and on down to current day Glenwood Springs and down what was called the Grand River Valley, now called the Colorado River Valley, uh, on to Grand Junction where the, the Ute were known to assemble during winter at the Grand Junction. Uh, Hayden concluded that this corridor trail up the Colorado and up the Crystal uh, over Schofield down through current day Crested Butte and over Monarch was one of the primary travel routes in the Colorado Territory. His maps are extremely accurate, uh, as I said, the first cartographically accurate depictions of the topography of the Colorado Mountains with the uh, various drainages and peaks and topo lines and so on. Uh, we have a photograph of what the survey party looked like. Apparently there were several teams roaming around Colorado and uh, and the one that came down the crystal did so in 1873-1874. The trail came down off Schofield and then down through the valley. We've got a nice slide here. Uh, I took out an airplane the other day showing the lower part of this corridor uh, reaching from Parham Creek down to Carbondale and then on down to Glenwood Springs below. We know from some historical accounts that the Ute uh, like to camp at present-day Faloha Meadows. Uh, they were known to be very partial to hot springs and of course we have Penny Hot Springs up there. There were eyewitness accounts recorded in the 1950s of early uh, white settlers that had remembered seeing the teepee villages at Faloha Meadows. I later learned both through some accounts and books and also talking to our friend Kenny Frost, who was a member of the Mountain Ute tribe, that this trail was also an escape route for the warriors that were involved in the defeat of the U.S. Army at the Battle of Milk Creek. That was the precipient, precipient action on the uh, Meeker Uprising. Uh, once the, the Ute at the Meeker uh, missionary learned of the Army's encounter with their warriors, then, then they dispatched the Reverend Meeker, and that's been dubbed the Meeker Massacre. It was a massacre of, of a few people following, really, an incursion of the army into the Ute Reservation. Um, the warriors that, that took on our army and, and actually beat it uh, escaped up this river valley on the Ute Trail that, that Hayden depicted. Uh, Kenny Frost has also related that um, ultimately Chief Uray sent runners around. That's how they communicated over distance and then he sent a runner to these warriors that were hiding out up on Schofield Pass and asked them to surrender. Soon after that the Ute were uh, forced to leave western Colorado 
Ironically enough, the Hayden survey maps were published in 1881 in the Atlas of Colorado, still indicating this whole area as part of the Ute Reservation, although by the time those books hit the, the bookshelf, uh, the reservation had been abolished and the Ute had been reduced to two land holdings in southwest Colorado as well as one in northeast Utah. So next we're going to look at what happened after the Ute were driven out of the valley and in that five-year period between the, the end of the Ute Reservation and um, the settlement of the Crystal River Valley, uh, there was only a trail up and down the crystal that the Ute had left behind. In the early 1880s, the tax assessor for Pitkin County was asked to go up and down the Crystal River Valley looking for accessible property and documented that uh, the trail had gotten to be in pretty shabby shape and if the county wanted him to continue to look for uh, ranches for tax assessments that he was going to need to have a wagon road. That's ultimately what the county provided between 1885 and 1890. A wagon road was constructed from the Garfield County line uh, to the Gunnison County line and we have the surveys of that today and we've gone out in the field and we've located uh, almost 100 percent of that road based on the surveys. Here's a, a photograph of what one of those wagon road surveys look like. They're pretty neat documents in that they're on canvas. They're about three by three uh, and they've got survey calls the whole way up and down the crystal uh, documenting the county's completion of this road. In general terms, the road went up the east side of the crystal as far as Redwind Point, crossed to the west side at Redwind Point, went up the west side of the river to Janeway, back to the east side to present-day Redstone, and then back to the west side onto the Gunnison County line. So the original wagon road wasn't exclusively on one side or the other, and there were several bridges that uh, were used to get back and forth. These photographs show the beginning of the road where it leaves uh, the Seven Oaks subdivision. Actually, the, the lower road, Bill Creek Road, is, a, is on top of this original wagon road, but uh, those uh, residents up there are, are well aware that, that you can follow the road up onto adjacent open space land uh, going upstream, and this is what some of these photos look like. I've also included uh, a section of the original survey map showing uh, what it looks like on the map as well as what you would see on the ground today. Later, the Crystal Railroad came, and um, that's an interesting moment in history, too. Between 1893 and 1899, John Osgood, then the sixth wealth wealthiest man in the world, uh, built the Crystal Railroad and did so to haul coal down from Coal Basin. Uh, he was an owner of the um, Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, and they needed that coal as a carbon source for the steel they were producing in Pueblo at the time. So the railroad came along, and without much coordination with Pitkin County, they started uh, building the grade and, in many cases, uh, put it on top or, or near the wagon road. Uh, this is a photograph looking at another of the maps that we utilized in our historic research. The General Land Office was a precursor to the Bureau of Land Management and sent federal surveyors into the valley between 1885 and on through uh, the turn of the century. And their job was really to look for homesteads and federal land patents to make the federal estate available to transfer to the private sector. These old maps from the 1890s are pretty interesting and the one here shows this period after the wagon road was constructed, before the railroad was built. This is on the east side of the Crystal River near Nettle Creek. Uh, this cabin that's pictured is still there. There's a very rare photograph showing the wagon road before the railroad was built. And today that house is still there, it's been remodeled, and those beautiful Ponderosa Pines are, are still there as well. It's shown on the 1890 map as the Daniels Cabin. Moving upstream, now we are at the, the junction of Nettle Creek and the Crystal River. 
when the railroad came through, you can see in the photograph, they laid the track right across the wagon road. Uh, this standpipe that's pictured was where they filled the steam engines with water out of Nettle Creek. And this was the last place that they had to fill the steam engines before they got to marble. Apparently there were times when they would run out of water before they got all the way to marble. And they'd have to uncouple the freight cars and coast into marble to, f to refill the engine and then go back and pick up their freight. But, but this is the standpipe that used to be at Nettle Creek. Moving upstream, uh, we've got a then and now photograph of a section of the railroad grade passing through an open space now known as Red Wind Point. Uh, popular misconception is that the white marble seen along the railroad grade fell off the trains. In fact, it was marble that had a flaw of one kind or another. Later in the history of the railroad, it was taken over by the marble concern uh, after coal production ceased and they had a ready supply of these marble fragments that were not marketable and they used them to riprap this grade. So I like to say we have the most exotic riprap in the world. When the railroad got to Redwine Point, they did something interesting. At that location, the county wagon road had crossed the river and this slide shows the location where that crossing was with a bridge. Well, when we were in that site with our archaeologist doing studies for the trail, she looked at the cliff face and seen in this photograph and, and concluded straight away that that face had been dynamited. Uh, the coloration on the rock is, is much fresher than the surrounding area. There's no varnish on the sandstone. So what the, the railroad did when they reached Redwine Point is they dynamited the cliff face. In doing so, they also destroyed the wagon road bridge and this document is a petition from many ranchers in the area, including Mr. Mobley, who started Janeway, uh, demanding that Pitkin County take legal action vis-a-vis -vis Colorado Fuel and Iron to repair this bridge and reopen the wagon road. Ultimately, the dispute between the railroad and the county was managed by the acquisition of, by Osgood of a, a competing railroad that was on the west side of the river and today Highway 133 sits on top of some sections of the original wagon road as well as sections of the Elk Mountain Railroad that were constructed uh, but never had track laid and uh, that's how we wound up with the uh, highway on the west side of the river and, uh, and other things going on on the east side of the river. A little further up, uh, the wagon road had been over on the west side uh, in this location, and this is a then and now depiction of what that looked like uh, in the 1890s versus what it looks like today. In the historic photograph, you'll note the wagon road over on the west side of the river. The railroad was just being constructed on the east side of the river. Uh, today, if you go to that same spot, you'll find that the river itself has been moved when Highway 133 was built in the 1960s, a significant amount of land was moved around and while people will talk about how pristine the Crystal Valley is, uh, when you really dig into it, you'll discover that a lot of the river has been moved around in uh, these various travelways, starting with the railroad and then the state highway in particular, have had a fairly dramatic impact on the natural course of the river. Reaching Janeway, the wagon road builders crossed back over the river. For years and years, I've been wondering where that bridge sat. Uh, the bridges they had at the time were very rudimentary log structures, and the bridges themselves are long gone. Uh, but we did find the abutments to the Janeway Bridge, and this upper photograph shows that. Uh, they were sitting right where the county wagon road survey, also pictured here, indicates they'd be. And for additional context, I have the uh, federal survey at the same time showing this bridge near Mobley's cabin. Again, Mobley being one of the gentlemen that had signed the petition demanding the county repair their bridge. From here, the wagon road uh, went up around um, Avalanche Creek uh, near the site of the alabaster mine that's in production today and wrapped around the backside of Elephant Butte. 
Uh, here's a photograph of what Mobley's cabin looks like today. Uh, still there, it's the last remnant of a little village called Janeway that had sprung up in this location, apparently numbering a few hundred residents at its zenith before commerce was ultimately moved down to Carbondale. Mobley's cabin served as both a stage stop and a railroad stop over time. Reaching Avalanche Creek, photograph here is the ford where the wagon road went across the creek. If you go there today, it's very obvious where that wagon road sits. Uh, again, it's depicted on the, the GLO map as well as the county survey. And this spot is where the wagon road was intersected by the railroad. When they came across Avalanche Creek, using their dynamite and their heavy equipment, the railroad builders were able to take a straight shot up the side of the Crystal River. Uh, some of that section of the grade has since become used as a private driveway. Um, and this is the location where they went right over the top of the original wagon road, and it's still visible today. Just above this spot, the railroad encountered a buttress on the side of Elephant Mountain, and they blasted their way through it. Uh, here's a photograph of a steam locomotive sitting in this exact spot uh, while the railroad was still in operation. And in this location, the wagons had gone down below, down to this location. I must say that the narrows of the Crystal River Valley, just below Penny Hot Springs, is one of the most scenic places you, you're, you're able to go. Um, it would be in a national park if it didn't have a state highway and, uh, and various settlements along it. it. It's really that beautiful. Moving up the narrows, uh, some photographs of the, the railroad grade here. And bringing us to another then and now photograph, uh, the black and white photograph was taken by Lewis McClure uh, after the Crystal Railroad had been built, you'll note there's two grades on the east side of the river, the upper one being the original wagon road, uh, the lower one being the railroad, and the grade over on the west side of the river having been built by the Elk Mountain Rail Railway that was ultimately adopted for use as the county road in later years and has since been integrated into Highway 133 up to one of our favorite uh, popular attractions in the valley, the Penny Hot Springs. Uh, there's been a lot of history there dating all the way back to the Ute, who were quite partial to this place. Um, but there's been a bathhouse of one kind or another there over the years. Um, more recently, that, that was taken down uh, while it was still in private ownership. Um, but the hot springs are, are still enjoyed today. Uh, the photograph that's uh, showing the snow cover taken from the east side of the river was on the day that the, the railroad rails were pulled up in this location. In 1942, that railroad was officially abandoned and the rails were pulled up, melted down into steel that uh, was in high demand in those years for uh, the war effort uh, with World War II. Now we've gotten up to Faloha Meadows proper, and in 1888, the Aspen Morning Chronicle reported that the county commissioners were appropriating $200 to pay the wagon road builders for their completion of the wagon road to this spot right here where this photograph was taken, uh, $200 to get the road to this point by 1888. Years later, the railroad would come through uh, on more or less the same alignment on the east side. Uh, and today, this meadow has become one of our premier wildlife preserves, home to a diversity of wildlife, including bighorn sheep, uh, a rare bat, uh, several rare plants. Uh, the, uh, the orchids love the, the warm marshes down below and um, it's one of our environmentally most sensitive places along the Crystal River. A little further up from Faloha Meadows, there's some interesting history. Uh, in 1888, no, none other than um, Doc Holliday had arrived in Glenwood and had heard that there were hot springs to be found up at Penny Hot Springs and took up residence for a couple of months with the Harony family 
uh, seeking to get a handle on his tuberculosis. The Herony cabin is depicted on the GLO maps and that's shown here. Uh, there is a photograph of this cabin that was published in a book called Doc Holliday, A Family Portrait that was written by one of his descendants. He spent two months at this cabin before retreating back to Glenwood where he died within a few months uh, in November of 1888. Now we're upstream of the Redstone Bridge by the Redstone Campground. Uh, again, a then and now photograph, uh, again a Lewis McClure photograph. We're fortunate to have uh, gained access to this through the Colorado History Museum. And this photograph shows the, the railroad going up the east side of the river on what's now Redstone Boulevard uh, and the grade of the Elk Mountain Railroad on the west side now being used for Highway 133. At the junction of Coal Creek and the Crystal River, uh, the map from the GLO office depicts the, the wagon road reaching this location and terminating there uh, sometime in the late 1880s above Coal Creek for a period of time. Uh, there only remained the Ute Trail as shown on the map. Uh, the photograph was taken several years later after Redstone had been settled by Osgood and shows uh, one of the bridges that sat in this location uh, that was destroyed in a flood around 1911. Uh, you see a gentleman uh, using the remains of this bridge uh, for a fishing platform. Um, from this point up, uh, the wagon road was completed in 1890. Uh, but uh, this is a location where the GLO maps, as well as the Hayden Survey maps, depict the original Ute Trail. In the same location, some years later, Osgood had founded Redstone. There's wonderful maps of Redstone to be found in the archives of Colorado Fuel and Iron and other places. And this particular map shows uh, by then the county wagon road leaving Redstone, le heading upstream on the west side leaving Redstone heading downstream on the east side and the railroad kind of coming right through. The railroad also crossed from the, from the east side to the west side in this location. The Open Space and Trails program has recently built this little uh, tourist information plaza on the exact site of the original train depot. Uh, these photographs show the same site uh, Around 1905 and today, you'll note the Coke oven sitting behind the locomotive that's parked here. Uh, we intentionally designed this uh, depot uh, to resemble a railroad structure with its cupola. Uh, Danny Muse designed that for us, and um, we're continuing the flavor of the original history of Redstone in that location. Leaving Redstone heading upstream, the county wagon road veered off of the current highway alignment up and around what uh, we now call the drool. Uh, it's an open space property sitting where the old roundhouse of the railroad was later constructed. has a nice ice climb on it. But along this route of the wagon road, you still find beautiful rock walls. And uh, this is an example of one of those rock walls. Now when Osgood built the castle, he built a private road from Redstone proper, past Cleveholm Manor, and then on up into Redstone Ranch Acres. Uh, that private road had several bridges that would cross over to the, the west side of the river. Two of those are depicted here, one of them that sits just downstream of the castle and the other one that sits upstream of the castle near where the remains of the hydroelectric powerhouse are still languishing on the side of the river. The color photograph here is a picture of a wagon road remnant climbing up onto what's now a subdivision where the, the uh, gamekeeper's cottage sits. Uh, Osgood had placed there. The historic photograph here is looking downstream across this location and the county wagon road is on the left side. The private road of Osgood is clear over on the east side and the railroad is coming right up the middle. At Hayes Falls, virtually every alignment 
starting with the Ute Trail to the highway we have today, went below Hayes Falls. The railroad built there, the county wagon road built there. I was fortunate to go back to this location with a Ute elder, Kenny Frost, and he blessed himself and me from the waters of Hayes Falls, which was very poignant. And, uh, and we honored the ancestors of the, the Ute uh, for their original uh, inhabitation of the valley and, uh, and their uh, trail that they had past the falls. Upstream of Hayes Falls, uh, we have the uh, excerpt from the historic newspaper showing that um, Charles, or excuse me, James Bogan had uh, been paid $2,000 to construct this remnant of the county wagon road. And um, there's a historic photograph that we obtained from the Denver Public Library uh, showing the wagon road in this location prior to the construction of the Crystal Railroad. Uh, so you'll see there's no grade down on the river, but the wagon road is working its way up to the right. And it remains there today. It's used by locals. Some call it the Bunker Hill Trail or the Bear Creek Trail. Another then and now photograph from a similar location just above Hayes Falls showing how the railroad was then constructed. Uh, when the highway came along, they took a much bigger bite of the land than did the railroad. And the, the original wagon road in this spot has been uh, taken apart by the excavation along the side of Highway 133. Uh, so I wasn't able to quite get to the spot where this original photograph was taken, but I'm within about 10 feet of it here. And um, today, it's a little difficult to get on that wagon road from the lower end by Hayes Falls, uh, much easier from up above because of this excavation along the side of the highway. Here's a piece of the old wagon road climbing up the hill up towards Bear Creek, uh, Mount Sopris in the background. It's a lovely trail and it's in use today. Where that wagon road had dropped back to river level is now at Highway 133, mile marker 48, if anyone wants to go find it. Um, a few years later, uh, the, the railroad came through. There's a historic photograph here from the Crystal Railroad Pictorial showing the railroad coming through here. Interestingly enough, the original coal mine at Placida uh, is right in this bend of the highway. Uh, if you pay careful attention, you can see the uh, tailings pile with the coal still laying around. Uh, ultimately, that mine proved to be dangerous because of methane explosions, and they discovered that there was a safer place to take the coal across the river uh, from Placida. Old maps of the evolution of Placida showing the wagon road and the evolution of the railroad in this location. Uh, here we have the photograph of the, the railroad running into Placida proper in the same location today is where uh, the road branches off of Highway 133. The railroad had continual problems with beaver dams flooding the railroad grade down through Placida and consequently when the wagon road was uh, replaced by the, the highway they chose the upper alignment uh, to avoid the, the wetlands down below. One of our nation's most sacred objects, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, rolled down this railroad grade in 1926. The largest block of marble ever quarried uh, now sits at Arlington National Cemetery. And uh, it's something to stand along that railroad grade and think of it rolling by in 1926 on its way to Washington, D.C. Of course, many of the monuments in Washington, as well as Denver and other places, have been built with marble that, that was transported down this railroad grade. The railroad also built a spur up along the east side of the river down to the second mine portal in Placida. And uh, the photograph shows where that railroad grade went up and over the top of the hill uh, at what is now the Placida Trailhead. It's hard to believe that they ever ran trains up, up that particular hill over the knoll, but, but there it is. There's the proof. Later, when Highway 133 was developed, 
it started out uh, that the road was down on the original railroad grade. Uh, the map shown here is on the wall of the Redstone Museum showing that um, the road from Carbondale to Marble had a turnoff that, that went up the old switchbacks that are still visible today. And um, the, the location of that junction is in the black and white photograph along with a, with a sign there saying uh, Paonia 20 miles. Uh, today that uh, spot has been regrown with grasses as the highway was moved uphill again to avoid the, the wetlands above Placita. Now we're all the way at the foot of McClure Pass at the Pitkin County line with Gunnison. Uh, the 1890 map here shows McClure's cabin. And amazingly enough, we have a photograph of that as well. Uh, these photos were supplied by the White River National Forest. A man named Sudworth came into the National Forest area in the 1890s to document natural resources before the White River Forest was formally designated. This photo shows the original McClure cabin that sat at the base of what's now McClure Pass. Uh, the cabin's long gone uh, and the highway is built on top of what became the wagon road, later the railroad, now State Highway 133. So there's our tour of ancient travel ways of the Crystal River Valley. Our final view is looking over Faloha Meadows with the narrows below, across Redstone and to the summit of McClure Pass. This is where our historical study concludes, though I note that the Ute Trail went from here over Schofield Pass and Gunnison County Wagon Road followed that same route. The Crystal Railroad would reach Marble uh, and uh, a vernacular had been built up to the Marble Quarry from there. Uh, but for the purposes of, of looking at the history of the corridor where the Carbondale Crested Butte Trail is now proposed, uh, this is the conclusion of our research and we've had a lot of fun putting it together and we've ho we hope that you've enjoyed it as well.